Thank you for the introduction. And I do realize that I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'm going to try as brief, try to be as brief as possible. Uh, so hopefully you can stick with me for a little bit, and we can talk about this. So um, I want to talk about um, the project with uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. It's a journey that we've embarked on about three and a half a, uh, years ago now. And um, it was a really very interesting project for many reasons, and I'll get into the details. But you know, as we started to work on this, we've also realized that we could actually impact a lot more people and bring that to a larger community. So I'll be talking about that as well. Um, so about, you know, I'm not sure how many of you are, are aware of that, but Intel has been supporting uh, Professor Stephen Hawking for all of his computing needs uh, for more than 20 years now. And it happened when um, our co-founder, uh, Dr. Gordon Moore, um, met Stephen at some event. And you know, he committed to him that Intel will be supporting all his computing needs uh, throughout his life. And in fact, uh, I guess thanks to Moore's Law, which we just celebrated the, the uh, 50th anniversary of, um, we've been able to get him about uh, a new machine on about uh, 18 months' cadence uh, since then. Now, you know, outside of just getting him the latest technology, about three and a half years ago, uh, Professor Hawking reached out to Dr. Moore again. And at that point, it wasn't really about you know, needing more compute power, but you know, he reached out to him to see if Intel can help uh, with his software uh, system that he's been using as it has gotten harder for him to actually control that interface. So um, a group of us, a multidisciplinary team of people from user research to interaction design uh, to different types of technologies, uh, went out there to try to figure out, is there anything that we can do? So we spent a lot of time observing him, speaking to him, speaking to his carers, uh, assistants, etc., trying to figure out what is he using his computer for? You know, what are areas of improvement that we can actually try um, to attack here? And is there stuff that we can leverage from a lot of the technology innovation that has happened since the last time his uh, system was upgraded, which was, you know, more than uh, 20 years? So, you know, as we started to actually look at this and, and, and investigate, we were actually quite excited that there are tons of technologies that are out on the market that maybe we can actually utilize. I mean, things from gaze tracking uh, to brain computer interface, et cetera. Um, but, you know, essentially, the more we started to look at this, the more we've realized that it's not that simple, right? So, <laughs> and, you know, it's, you know, the minute you start to talk about people who have used technologies for, for a long period of time and have gotten actually used to specific parts of that technology, it's very hard to just say, well, let's start from scratch. We're going to just go and invent all sorts of new things. So as we've worked with Stephen, we've realized that he wasn't really interested in something that was completely revolutionary. He wanted something that was familiar, right? He wanted something that felt similar to what he's had but that could solve a lot of the, the problems and be more efficient. Um, the other thing that we've realized is that, you know, initially when we heard about the problem statement, the problem statement was, can we improve his word per minute rate? But then as we started to observe him, we've realized that Stephen doesn't just use his computer to communicate with people, right? He uses his computer like all of us do. He still you know, delivers lectures, he writes uh, papers and, and books, he um, surfs the web for research, etc. And every single time he needed to do one of those operations, he wanted to be completely independent. He didn't want to go call in somebody to actually do these things, right? So that system needed to enable him to actually do all of these things and continue to do all of these things. So, um, just to kind of give you guys a sense of, of what that system, his existing system that he was using, um, looked like. So it's essentially three parts. Basically, where you see in the, in the circle that I have here, it's actually an infrared um, sensor that sits on his glasses. And basically what it's doing is just detecting um, every time he moves his cheek. So every time he moves his cheek, a uh, signal gets sent to his uh, uh, software interface. Now, the software interface is essentially something that's trying to sit between him and a Windows, a typical Windows operating system, right? So what it needs to do is essentially 
emulate a mouse and a keyboard. So imagine something that's you know, continuously moving if he's on the keyboard, and the minute um, the, the cursor goes over the letter of interest, it will actually trigger, he will trigger the interface from his cheek, and then it will select that specific letter or word or whatever. And then the third part of the system is actually his uh, hardware synthesis system. So, you know, one of the things that Stephen is, is, you know, very keen on keeping and preserving as is, is his special voice, right? And his special voice is the way it is because of the advancement of the technology at that point when actually that was put in place. But he became, you know, he, he started to identify with that voice and that is his voice, right? So that part of the system, he didn't want changed at all, even though the technology has advanced quite a bit in that space. So, uh, so basically what we've realized is that what we really need is kind of a holistic solution. We need to look at how do we change the software interface that he's using without really making it unfamiliar, um, which is quite constraining, but we also needed to look at what are different ways of maybe triggering the interface, what are the issues with the sensor, and so on. So if you think about a Windows system or any graphical user interface for that matter, you know, it tends to be intuitive, you know, people don't necessarily have to remember things and so on. The problem with it though is that it assumes that people can easily move a mouse. And when you're using mouse emulation, that's clearly not the case. So I figured usually, um, a video is worth a thousand words. Um, so basically, what I'm showing here, and hopefully, yeah, that is the right video. So basically, what it's doing is that you know he he wants to do something very basic, right? Which is open a file in Notepad. So now he's going to the mouse menu, trying to emulate the mouse, and what you can see is this thing kind of moving up until it gets to actually the Notepad shortcut, and then he triggers it with the sensor. And now back in there, and he opens Notepad. Now he needs to open a file. And you know, surprisingly enough, Stephen actually remembers a lot of the shortcuts to actually open these things. So he does a shortcut to open this. But now once he's opened this, he needs to go and navigate to that search bar to actually start to type that. And again, that's a series of mouse emulations. So you start to see this thing kind of go down. And eventually, it starts to go across the screen again until it actually hits that position. And then finally, he can go in and start to type. And then after he typed again, he needs to go and navigate once that you know, file name actually shows up. So imagine this, right? It's something as simple as opening a file. And instead, it translates to a whole series of interactions, which takes, on average, three to four minutes. So clearly, that's pretty painful. And you know, I'm actually running it at a much faster speed here just to you know, not bore you completely to death. But you know, eventually, you'll, you'll see this thing come up, and, and he will go trigger it. So then we started to think about this. And we said, well, you know, if you think about it, that's opening a file. He shouldn't think of opening a file as a series of interactions. He should just think of opening a file as opening a file. So then um, let me stop that and go to the next video, which is you know, what we said. OK, well, we can automate a lot of this under the hood. So eventually, you know, he can just go to an open file thing, which is similar to his existing interface, and it will bring, it will go search for all the files, it knows where all his stuff is, and it will just, you know, he can start to type a couple of letters, and all of a sudden, the file that he wants shows up, and he does it. So essentially, what we've done is we've turned um, about a three to four minute operation into about a 10 second operation. So, you know, clearly what we were trying to do is not design something that just opened files. So, you know, watching him and observing him for all of this time, we've come to understand what are all of these common functions that he does on a regular basis, and how do we start to actually automate a lot of these things under the hood and make it very accessible. So one of the things that we've done, for example, is we would understand what specific application he's using at the time automatically, and then based on that, surface all the relevant actions for that specific application. So if he's an Internet Explorer, we'll bring an Internet Explorer contextual menu whenever he needs to do something, and he could search easily or whatever. Um, you know, I talked about searching files, you know, launching applications, same thing. He shouldn't have to go to a mouse to actually launch an application. It, it should be in something that's very familiar and very similar and so on. Um, one of the interesting things that you start to find out as you you know, look at these different things is you, you, there are things that we didn't even think about, right? So, 
you know, because of the fact that that sensor is actually sitting on his face, when he starts eating, that starts to trigger the sensor, right? And kind of the downside of actually word prediction is that if you come, continue to click through a word predictor, things start to make sense, right? I mean, for, you know, completely random actions are formulating sentences that sound, you know, that don't necessarily make sense, but sound like the regular, you know, put together sentences. So one of the things that he needed, for example, is a notion of a mute, right? So, but the mute, how do you then trigger a mute with that, right? So it's like, okay, well, we don't want false positives and we can trigger the mute through a very specific action that he would do to unmute the system. So, you know, essentially through working with them for about three years and doing more than 50 iterations of the system, we started to essentially start to solve one problem after another to a point where we've actually gotten to something that is, um, you know, something that has given him quite a bit of improvement. So a lot of the things that I've talked about in terms of, you know, automating a lot of these actions, we've seen about um, 10 times improvement in speed in doing these common operations. The other thing that we've realized is, you know, again, the word per minute was important because he still needs to communicate with other people. So one of the things that we've done is we've um, integrated a um, uh, word prediction from SwiftKey and we've tailored it in a way that can actually work for Steven and understand his vocabulary and be much more efficient for him, which essentially resulted in about twice um, the speed of his uh, typing. So, you know, that, that is about kind of the software interface and what we've done along those lines. Um, something that I mentioned as well was this notion of how, what do we do better in terms of, how can we do better in terms of the sensing piece? Um, so the, the first thing that, that we've noticed is that the existing um, infrared sensor, the analog sensor that he was using, required a lot of mucking with it, right? So in days where, for example, he couldn't move his face a lot, you know, people had to come in and actually adjust the sensitivity, increase it. Um, if he had a lot of motion that the next day they would have to decrease it. And it's, it's a constant thing, right? People are coming in and out doing that. Um, so we've realized, okay, well, you know, there are new technologies with digital sensors out today, thanks to advancement in mobile phones. So can we actually now create an adaptive system that can understand the difference between kind of like a good day and a bad day and, you know, automatically adjust that signal without requiring that continuous thing and, you know, continuous people mucking with it. And again, that kind of helps with the whole notion of independence that I was talking about because, you know, he's, he's not dependent on others to do that. And, you know, so this system is still kind of under development, but I, you know, just to kind of give you a sense of what a sensor like this would look like. So you could see, you know, the, just the light flashing and the, the signal being um, uh, figured out. The other thing that we wanted to do is actually, you know, if you think about an infrared sensor, you have a single point on the face that you're actually triggering. But if you think about the camera, a camera is looking at the whole face. So the other thing that we've been working on is essentially developing um, a system that can recognize these different facial gestures through a camera. Um, and you know, by applying, for example, depth information, you can get much more resilient um, uh, capability. So, so that's as far as Steven is concerned, right? So we continue to innovate on, on these different things and continue to improve it. But, you know, in the process of this exploration, what we've recognized is that, you know, because of the fact that this was such an iterative design process, um, we realized that we had to make a system that is very configurable because we didn't really know what would work, right? So we kept swapping in and out different technologies. We're, you know, building different things. We're changing the interface. We bring in different sensors, etc. So we had to build something that was completely configurable. Um, and after we spent all of these, you know, couple of years actually developing that system, we've realized that that has a lot of potential for the larger community, right? Because if you think about it, researchers tend to be, you know, focused on a specific area, whether it's a sensing modality, whether it's a um, word prediction software, whatever it is, right? But to be able to take that innovation and take it to users is very hard because you have to build this whole complete system to make that happen. So we thought, okay, well, if we actually open source that system, will enable you know, developers, researchers, you know, people in the community to go and bring their solutions to actually the community and innovate in that space. And it's actually something that um, just went live. Uh, it's on, um, you can see the, the link below. And you know, we've been working with um, different researchers and actually end users to try to understand 
you know, uh, how we can actually in enhance the system, bring in different capabilities to, uh, to enable really a larger community. So one thing I want to kind of end with here is one of the things that I'm truly excited about is, you know, this notion of bridging the, the gap between technologies for the general public and technologies for people with disability. So if you think about assistive technologies today, they, they tend to be extremely expensive, and they tend to essentially lack in terms of ability to rev them quite a bit. And that's because they don't really um, utilize the economies of scale. But if you start to think about what has happened recently with technology and technology going mobile, what was really pretty amazing about that is that we went away from computing being a destination where you go and sit in front of your computer and you're working with it to something that you carry with you everywhere. And as a result, it needed to adjust to a lot of our own disabilities when we're driving cars, when we're running down hallways, etc. So the cool thing about this is a lot of these technologies that really were built for the general public, whether it's just, I mean, speech recognition or speech synthesis or word prediction, because it's very hard to type on a smartphone, now are things that are really available for people to go create very interesting assistive technologies without having to reinvent the wheel, but focus on the interface and how to bring those technologies to bear. So to not keep you away from food, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and staying through that with me. Really appreciate it. <laughs>